So I think we're all set. Without further ado, I'd like to I'd like to introduce Guido Schmidt and Daniel Fett, who are going to be having this talk on a single sign-on on the web. Give them a big round of applause, and uh, I hope you're looking forward to the talk. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our talk on the security and privacy of modern single sign-on in the web. So in this talk, uh, Daniel and me, uh, we are going to present not only just attacks uh, on OAuth and OpenID Connect, but also some uh, thoughts about analysis of all these standards. So first, a brief introduction. Who are we? We are researchers from the University of Trier, but soon of uh, University of Stuttgart. And also, we happen to be the founders of uh, the Machine Deck hackerspace in Trier and uh, the uh, Pie and More Raspberry Jam. If you're interested in uh, anything else, what we are doing, you can just follow us on Twitter. So, what is this single sign on about? What are we talking about? So, um, Probably all of you have seen uh, websites like this, uh, like TripAdvisor, where you can use a lot of different methods to sign in. You can sign in with your Facebook account, with your Google account. You can register account at their page with email address and password. Or you can use your Samsung account, or probably now uh, even more different systems. And if you click, for example, on this Login with Facebook button, a new window pops up prompting for your Facebook uh, credentials, or if you're already signed in into Facebook, just asks for confirmation. So uh, this is a setting we are looking at. And um, we have two parties here. We have, uh, the, we have TripAdvisor as the so-called relying party, and we have Facebook as the so-called identity provider. And um, the basic principle on, of how this works is the following. So first, you go with your browser to the relying party. You say, I want to log in with that IDP. Then you contact your identity provider, authenticate there. Uh, and this identity provider then issues some kind of token. And this token you give to the relying party. And the relying party can now use this token to access some parts of your account at the identity provider. And um, this is called authorization. For example, the relying party can use this token now to post on your Facebook timeline or uh, reach out your friends list from Facebook. And it can, uh, the relying party can also retrieve some unique user identifier and then consider you to be logged in with that user identifier. And then this is authentication. And uh, then RP can set, for example, some session cookie and mark this session belongs. Uh, remember that this session belongs to this user. So this is the, was the basic, the basic principle. Why shouldn't we, should we use single sign-on or why shouldn't we use single sign-on? So for users, it's very uh, convenient. You don't have to remember which account you used where, which you password, and so on. You just click and log in with Facebook, and you're all done. Of course, this comes with lack of privacy, because Facebook then always knows where you log in. Um, and also, the identity provider you choose is also a single point of failure. If that one closes down or changes its terms and conditions, then you pro perhaps can, cannot log in into your accounts anymore at some third-party web pages. So for relying parties, they need to store less data. They don't have to care about password databases that can leak. They don't have to care about user registration, password recovery, and all the hassle that comes with user accounts. But they also have less control over, this, over the, the user's accounts because they outsource the authentication to this identity provider. And also here, the identity provider is a single point of failure. So for identity providers, the advantage is clear. They get more user data. 
and they can provide some service for their users, which makes perhaps it's, it makes it more attractive for users to use that identity provider. Um, on the downside, they also have to take care about more user data, they have to store and protect it, and they have to have the overhead of implement, implementing and running this single sign-on system. So, what are uh, these single sign-on systems? Uh, now, we, uh, now I will show you some prominent examples. So there is OAuth 1.0, so this is a not so modern single sign-on system. It's now 10 years old. Many flaws uh, are known for this system, and basically nobody use, uses it anymore except for Twitter. So Twitter uses a modified version of OAuth 1, um, which uh, more or less fixes all the known flaws, but in general you can, we can say don't use OAuth 1. There is also OpenID, which is also quite old, nine years. It's, it's um, yeah, not that user-friendly. It's uh, a standard that's meant to be super flexible for every corner use case that the developers at that time thought of. Um, and this makes it also extremely hard to use correctly, because you have a lot of things going on, things change during an open ID run ad hoc, and it's uh, um, yeah, not that nice to develop open, something for open ID. So also for open ID, don't use this. And there are now modern single sign-on systems, for example, OAuth 2, which is also used in login with Facebook. Um, this is completely incompatible to OAuth uh, 1. And um, OAuth 2 uses the so-called so BIRA token approach. That is, they, uh, the, um, the whole protocol is based on um, some uh, random values uh, that are passed around, but there's no crypto involved, except for the transport layer for HTTPS, for example. And OAuth 2 is yeah, used everywhere almost, so it's the most popular of these systems, but it has never been developed for authentication. And really, it's not meant for authentication, and if you Google for OAuth 2 and authentication, you yeah, after some time stumble upon the following picture. So these two guys are members of the OAuth working group, and they really insist it's not meant for authentication at all. It's just for authorization. Okay, um, nonetheless, it is used in practice also for authentication. Facebook, for example, uses it for authentication. And so this protocol is now mm, five years old. Many flaws have been discovered. Most of them have been fixed. I will talk about some of these flaws later in the talk. So this is OAuth 2, and there's also OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect is quite new. It's from it's yeah one and a half years old, and it's an authentication layer on top of OAuth. So. Uh, um, the first definition or real definition on how you should use OAuth for authentication, but it changes the standard also a bit, so it can be seen as a protocol of it on its own. But OpenID Connect, although despite the name, it's also completely incompatible to OpenID. And it has also some dynamic features like IDP discovery, uh, identity provider discovery, and stuff like that. So this leads us to the web signal sign-on chart of confusion. So we have OAuth 1, which is the marketing predecessor of OAuth 2, but completely incompatible to OAuth 2. And OAuth 2 serves as the, uh, uh, as the foundation for login with Facebook, for authentication, and also for OpenID Connect. And OpenID Connect, there's OpenID, which is the marketing predecessor of OpenID Connect, but the uh, same here, it's not compatible to each other. And OpenID Connect is used, uh, for example, by, uh, by Google. <coughs> so these are the uh, most commonly used uh, web single sign-on systems. There, is also, there are also some others. For example, Mozilla Persona. Who of you have heard about Mozilla Persona? Oh, okay, around 5%, more or less. So it's, uh, uh, the original name is Browser ID, and there the idea was to, um, 
that the email providers become the identity providers. So this comes from the thought that for classical website where you have to register, they send you emails with tokens you can click on to log in into your account or to rec uh, um, and to reset your password, so your identity, uh, so your email provider already is a kind of identity provider. So why don't uh, we just use it uh, directly in the web? And Mozilla uh, Persona is the first single sign-on system with the goal that uh, we have some kind of privacy in the sense that the identity provider does not learn where you use your accounts. So we will talk about this also later in this talk. So it was developed by Mozilla, and they, the first idea was to integrate this protocol in the browsers, which never happened. So they uh, um, went for the target to have a pure web implementation using just HTML5, and they also built bridges to OpenID uh, and to OAuth to uh, get some big identity providers in the system. But this, uh, this whole approach uh, failed, but it's still interesting if you want to look uh, for privacy. Okay, there are also some other uh, protocols I haven't talked about, um, and now I will hand over to Daniel. So, um, what is this talk all about? Um, <laughs> so, what is our talk all about? Um, so, what we want to do is we want to analyze whether web mechanisms, in this case, web single sign-on protocols, are secure when they are implemented correctly. Um, so this means if we follow all the standards and all the best practices. Or in other words, are the standards and protocols that define the web secure? And um, so the current, like, the current state of the art um, is that we have a lot of documents that define some lock-in mechanism, for example, <laughs> like OAuth. And we have an expert or a group of experts, and they look at this, and after a while they say, well, this seems kind of okay-ish to me. So they say it's secure. So this is the current state of the art. And what we want to do also as part of our PhD research is to change this um, in a way that has been already successful for other things uh, in, a web, uh, in the internet, for example, for TLS. Um, we want to create a model of the web infrastructure and of web applications, a formal model. And uh, these models, of course, they are also always uh, incomplete, uh, but nonetheless useful, um, as has been shown with TLS 1.3. Um, so we create this model, and then we put a lot of work into this. And finally, hopefully, we can create proofs of security for mechanisms or for standards. Um, so, uh, of course, the hard part is number two here, um, as always. Um, and some things our model cannot capture, and we don't want to capture these. Um, so, for example, phishing attacks or click-jacking attacks or just stupid users that send their password to the attacker. Um, these are things that are out of the scope of the stuff that we are looking at here. Um, in the same uh, manner, uh, compromised browsers or comprom compromised databases and so on. Um, so when we have this model for a web application, um, one important question, and mainly, maybe the most important question is, what is security? And what is privacy, if we want to look at privacy as well? Um, so we have to define this, and luckily we can define this if we have a formal model uh, like we have. Um, in the following, of course, I'm not going to present all the formal stuff. This is boring. Um, therefore, I'm, I have a high-level overview of what our authentication properties, for example, look like. Authentication in a web single sign-on system means that an attacker that even has full control over the network, say NSA, should not be able to use a service of a relying party as an honest user. So the NSA should be unable to log into my account, at least, yeah, if they're not coercing the owner of the relying party or something. Um, and this is an obvious property. Um, there's a slightly less obvious property, um, which says that an attacker should not be able to authenticate an honest browser to a relying party as 
the attacker. So the attacker should be unable to force Alice's browser to be locked in under the attacker's identity. This is a property that is often also called session fixation or session swapping, uh, because if the attacker would be able to do this, he could, for example, force me to be locked in at some search engine. And if I then search something with the search engine and I'm locked in into the attacker's account, then the attacker could be able to read what I'm searching for at the search engine. Okay, so these are the authentication properties. Then we also have another property that is important, namely session integrity. Session integrity means that if the relying party acts on Alice's behalf at the identity provider or retrieves Alice's data at the identity provider, then Alice explicitly expressed her consent to log in at this relying party. So, yeah. Um, this is session integrity. And the third property that we have is privacy. And privacy in this case means that a malicious identity provider should not be able to tell whether the user logs in at the relying party A or relying party B. So, um, for example, if auth would have privacy, which it doesn't, um, then Facebook would be unable to tell whether I log in at, say, Wikipedia or myfavoritebeer.com. There are also other notions of privacy, which we, however, will not look at in this talk. Okay. Okay. Um. That's, okay, good. Let's start with a um, more closer look to uh, OAuth. Oh, uh, when we, I uh, say OAuth, I always mean OAuth 2, not the older OAuth 1. So uh, OAuth 2 is mainly defined in RFC 6749 and also some other RFCs and some other documents. Uh, OAuth itself, uh, has four different modes it can run in. So there's the implicit mode, the authorization code mode, the resource owner password credentials mode, the client credentials mode, and um, all these modes can uh, have so, uh, many options, uh, which I won't list here. And uh, out of these four modes, uh, the first two implicit mode and the authorization code mode are the most common ones. So uh, let's have a closer look at these modes. So the implicit mode uh, works like this. Here we have an example with some random relying party and Facebook as the identity provider. So first you say, I want to log in with Facebook at your relying party. Then your browser gets redirected to Facebook. Facebook prompts you for your authentication data or for some confirmation if you're already logged in at Facebook. And then um, Facebook issues uh, a token that's called the access token. And uh, Facebook redirects your browser back to the lying party and puts the access token in the uh, URI. Um, and then for some technical reasons, uh, we need uh, some additional steps to retrieve this uh, access token from the URI because it's in the fragment part. Uh, and then finally, the um, uh, relying party gets retrieved this access token. And now with this access token, this is an access, an access token is uh, the same, uh, basically the same thing as uh, in the uh, in this first high-level overview when I just talked about tokens. So access token is such a token which gives the relying party access to the user's account at Facebook. Um, and now the uh, relying party can retrieve data or act on the user's behalf at Facebook or it can retrieve a user identifier and then consider this user to be logged in and issue, for example, some cookie. Um, so this is the implicit mode. There's also uh, the authorization code mode. Um, there things start similar. The user says, I want to log in with Facebook, gets redirected to Facebook, authenticates at Facebook, and then Facebook, instead of issuing an access token, it issues a so-called authorization code. 
And uh, the relying party then takes this authorization code and redeems it for an access token directly at Facebook. So we have here some uh, one intermediate step with this uh, authorization code. And then the uh, access token, the uh, RP, uh, the relying party retrieved, uh, it can then use to act on the user's behalf at Facebook or consider the user to be logged in. So let's talk about selected attacks on OAuth. Um, first, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, known attacks. There are attacks like uh, the so-called cut and paste attacks, where you re uh, reuse some of these code tokens, like access token or authorization code, or there are also some other tokens which I haven't talked about, so I left out some details before. Um, this, it's about reusing these tokens from different flows, mixing uh, them into a new flow, and then break the system. Um, so there are a lot of cut and paste attacks known, and uh, the, the OAuth working group uh, um, is uh, continuously giving advice on uh, how to prevent these cut and paste attacks. Uh, another problem is if you don't use HTTPS, then you are screwed, because a man in the middle can easily read everything, uh, all the tokens that are exchanged. So if you are in some Wi-Fi and the guy next to you is uh, sniffing on the Wi-Fi, you log in and don't use HTTPS because some developers forgot that there is uh, the, uh, something called HTTPS, then basically the whole thing is screwed. And uh, also if you um, just rely on cookies, uh, then you're also screwed because cookies lack integrity. It's very easy to just uh, inject uh, cookies into your browser over HTTP, and then these cookies will later also be used over HTTPS. So, um, yeah, cookies uh, are also not uh, a good thing to rely on. So, uh, let's talk about uh, some attacks we have found in our research. There is uh, the 307 redirect attack, and uh, it works like this. Uh, first, we have some regular OAuth flow, and um, if we uh, <coughs> in this uh, OAuth flow, if you have a closer look at uh, what happens here in step two to four, we have the user authentication, and after this authentication, the user gets redirected back to the relying party. Um, if you look uh, more into the details of these requests, um, so first you have this request where you go to your identity provider and ask, I have, uh, and start the uh, OAuth flow there. So you just came from the relying party where you want to log in, clicked on that button, log in with this IDP, you get redirected and then your browser contacts this identity provider here. I've been redirected to you uh, in an OAuth flow. Please authenticate the user. So this is the step 2A. Um, then your identity provider returns some uh, form where you have to enter your username and your password usually. And then you enter your username and password and these are sent over to the identity provider. And now, if this identity provider redirects you back to uh, you know, the relying party and uses the wrong HTTP location redirect method for this, namely the 307 uh, method, then um, the following happens. The browser is instructed to just repost all your credentials. So uh, if you're logging in at some malicious relying party, uh, that relying party gets your username and password. Uh, so this happens if you use 307 redirect. Fortunately, we uh, didn't find any identity provider in the wild who actually uses 307, but um, you can never exclude that there is some implementation which makes actually use of this uh, um, location redirect method. Um, also, it's, if you look at the standard, how these are defined, it's not always clear which uh, redirect method uh, has uh, which details in behavior. Uh, 
And also the OAuth working group didn't think about this. So in their standard, they write, ah, use, just use any method. And surely the mitigation here uh, is uh, don't use 307, for example, use 303 instead. So the next attack is the identity provider mix-up attack. I will present this in implicit mode and only one variant of, uh, of this attack. Um, so um, here in this um, attack, uh, we have the, set, uh, have the following setting. We have uh, from step two on, all these requests are usually encrypted. But the very, very first request, there uh, we cannot be sure it is encrypted because a um, lot of web uh, relying parties, when you go to their website, you go over HTTP. And um, this, this very first information, where you just click, I want to use Facebook to log in, there you could uh, easily assume this is not a sensitive information. So this for very first request goes often unencrypted, or if you, uh, for example, consider other attacks like TLS stripping, then uh, you also cannot guarantee that this uh, request is uh, uh, encrypted. So now for an attacker who, for example, sits in the same Wi-Fi network as you, so probably the guy next to you, could easily mount the attack as follows. So when your browser sends this request to a relying party, um, log in with Facebook, the attacker can easily change this and change it to uh, yeah, ju just use the identity provider that is run by the attacker. Uh, remember, you can have a lot of different options of uh, identity providers, and uh, with some extension, this can also be extended dynamically just by entering some domains. Um, and then the relying party thinks, okay, that user wants to use the attacker identity provider. Um, it answers with a redirect to, this, uh, to the attacker's web page. But now, the, as the attacker still sits as man in the middle, he can just change it back to Facebook. So the OAuth dance continues as usual. You go to Facebook, uh, authenticate there, you get redirected back with uh, probably some access token, and then uh, eventually the relying party retrieves this access token and wants to use this access token. So what happens? It won't use this uh, access token at Facebook, but at the, relying, at the attacker instead, because it still thinks that the attacker is the identity provider that is used here. So in practice, if you want to mount this attack, then you have to take uh, care of more details, like uh, uh, when you want to break authentication instead of authorization. So in the version I just presented, the attacker gets the access token, can act on the user's behalf at Facebook or at some other identity provider that uses OAuth. Uh, so this is not limited to Facebook. Um, but for bre to break authentication at the relying party, there are some other further steps needed. But there's also, there are also some other details that uh, have to be taken care of, like client identifiers, uh, which RPs use, relying parties is used to identify themselves to uh, identity providers, the same for client credentials which are optional, by the way. Um, and in OpenID Connect, the layer on top of OAuth, if this is used, then you need to take care about some other stuff like the um, switching off some signatures or uh, exchanging some signatures uh, and so on. But it's still possible, so that we uh, successfully attacked real-world applications, uh, and this definitely works. And there are also some variants that do not rely on that first request going over HTTPS. But explaining all the variants would take a whole talk on its own. So um, we'll now skip this and talk about mitigation. So the mitigation we propose is quite simple. So the, uh, the one problem is here in step three, this access token is just some opaque string. The relying party cannot see what, uh, who issued that access token, so it needs some further information carried along with this access token, and that is who is the identity provider which issued this access token. And if you have this information carried along, uh, 
then um, the relying party can easily detect this attack and see that there's a mismatch in step five to the one in step uh, 1a, where the, where the relying party received the message, the attacker identity provider is to be used, and in five it gets the message, here's an access token and it's from Facebook, so there's a mismatch and this whole flow can be aborted without uh, the attack uh, being successful. So, uh, this is the mitigation. Uh, we talked to the uh, OAuth working group at the IETF, so they invited us to a kind of emergency meeting to discuss uh, this attack, and uh, we scheduled public disclosure of these attacks, uh, so at the beginning of this year. Uh, in June, we had a, uh, this triggered an OAuth security workshop, which uh, took place in June. New RFC with this uh, with the mitigations is in preparation, and also the working group is uh, uh, showed uh, interest in the kind of formal analysis uh, we do to this. Star uh, we uh, carry out for these kind of standards. So to sum up, the security for OAuth two, if you have <laughs> all these. Um, fixes applied and uh, there are no implementation errors, then uh, we can say that in terms of security, OAuth 2 is uh, quite good. We have a uh, formal proof in our model for this, but uh, regarding privacy, um, OAuth 2 uh, does not provide any privacy at all. Speaking about privacy, um, we mentioned er earlier already that there was a single sign-on system that tried to provide privacy, namely browser ID, alias Mozilla Persona. Um, so as we already said before, this is a web-based single sign-on system with the design goals of having no central authority and provide better privacy. Um, spoiler alert, they failed at both. Um, so, so how does browser ID work? So let's have a look at this on a very high level first. Um, so as Guido already said, in browser ID, the mail provider is the identity provider. So we have a user, Alice, alice at mailprovider.com, and in the first phase, when using browser ID, um, she does the following. Uh, she goes to her identity provider and first creates a public-private key pair. And then, she sends the public key in a document with her own identity to the mail provider, and the mail provider then signs this document. And this creates the so-called user certificate, and this certificate is then sent back to Alice. Now, in the second phase, if Alice wants to actually log in at some website, and then she does the following. She creates another, another document, containing the identity of the website where she wants to log in, say Wikipedia. And to do so, see, she signs the identity of Wikipedia with her own private key, and this creates the so-called identity assertion. Now, Alice sends both documents to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia can then, of course, check these documents, because Wikipedia can uh, check First, it can retrieve the public key of the mail provider, can check the user certificate, and then also can, can check the identity assertion. And yeah, then Wikipedia can consider Alice to be logged in. So this was the basic idea of browser ID, which is quite nice and clean and simple. And uh, then they started to implement this um, using just standard browser features, uh, including all the workarounds for the Internet Explorer, um, and so on and so on. And they ended up with a quite complicated system. Um, so here we have um, on the left side in Alice's browser uh, two windows, namely Wikipedia, and the login dialog, which is provided by a central authority, which they try to avoid, um, login.persona.org. And inside both of these windows there are other iframes, and uh, inside one of these iframes there's another iframe. And on the right, we have the servers, so the relying party, the identity provider, and the central authority, uh, login.persona.org. And just to give you an idea how complex the system ended up, um, they all talk to each other using HTTP requests, but also using post messages, 
and also using XML HTTP requests. And as you can see, the system uh, became quite complex. Um, to add even more complexity, they did the following. They thought, well, some users, they are already using Gmail or Yahoo, so let's provide some nice yeah, interface for them. Um, they provided the so-called identity <laughs> bridges, specifically for Gmail and Yahoo, which at the time supported OpenID uh, authentication only. And they created two new servers, the so-called bridging servers, one for, site, for Gmail called Sideshow, and the other one for Yahoo called Big Tent. Now, the user authenticates, authenticates to the bridging server using OpenID, and then a bridging server has an interface to the standard browser ID interface. Um, yeah, so one problem was that OpenID identities, um, they are not email addresses, so in OpenID you add an attribute, which is called the email attribute, and um, we are talking about this email attribute in a minute. So let's have a look at how these identity bridges work. Um, we are not going into all the details of the uh, browser ID or persona protocol, because this would be too complicated, but the identity bridge is uh, interesting and also important for some of the attacks that we found. So in the identity bridge, the following happens. So here on the left, we have Alice's browser. In the middle, we have Sideshow, so this identity bridge. And on the right side, we have Gmail, which could also be Yahoo in this case, but yeah. Let's say it's Gmail. So first, the uh, user says that she wants to log in at Sideshow. And then Sideshow sends an OpenID request, requesting the email attribute signed from Gmail. This request is then forwarded to Gmail, and Gmail sees this uh, request. The user logs in at Gmail uh, for authentication. And then Gmail creates this OpenID assertion which contains the signed email address attribute for Alice. And as you can see, this is all in a green box, so all properly signed and nice. And now Alice's browser redirects this document to Sideshow. Now Sideshow doesn't check the contents of this assertion for itself. Instead, it sends these uh, things to Gmail. Gmail checks everything that is signed and tells Sideshow, yes, this document looks correct to me. Everything that was signed was signed by me and was not tampered with. Then Sideshow looks, looks at the document and sees, ah, Alice wanted to log in, so this must be Alice, the user must be Alice now, and provides a cookie because the user is now logged in as Alice. So far, so <laughs> simple. Now for some of the attacks that we found. Um, First attack, identity forgery. So uh, here we have essentially the same that we saw before, the same setting, except now we don't have Alice's browser on the left, we have the attacker's browser on the left. The attacker can go to Sideshow and say, I want to sign in. Now Sideshow sends this OpenID request to the attacker, and the attacker can change this request. The attacker can just remove the request for the email attribute from this request, which is still a valid OpenID request. Gmail sees this request, and um, now the, the attacker logs in. The attacker doesn't have Alice's user data, so she, uh, the attacker just logs in with his own credentials. And now Gmail creates an OpenID assertion containing the signed attribute uh, which was requested, which was none, so essentially the document is empty, at least it is without any email address. Now the attacker can simply add a new attribute to this document containing an email address that he has chosen arbitrarily. This of course is not signed, which is not a problem uh, because this document can be partly signed, and this document is forwarded to Gmail. Gmail now analyzes this document and sees, well, there's a signed part in this document, so I check this signed part. This signed part doesn't contain anything useful, um, but it is correct. 
it's not the wrong signature. So it checks out. Um, and it sends back to Sideshow. Yeah, I checked this document, looks fine to me. Now Sideshow looks at the document, sees that there's an email attribute, uses this email attribute, and the attacker is signed in into any Gmail account that he likes with browser, uh, that is used with browser ID. Okay, so this is bad, as you can imagine. And we uh, told the Mozilla guys about this, and they were quite fast. So uh, we were really surprised. They were really quick. Um, so I think it was in the middle of the night for most of them, but they uh, scrambled in the bug tracker and uh, they wrote some patches and so on and so on. And I think it wasn't 24 hours later that it was all deployed and fi fixed. So this was quite good. Um, but then we took another look at the system. And we found identity forgery number two, which is actually remarkably similar. Um, it works as follows. So the attacker sends uh, the authentication request, you know this part, um, and Sideshow uh, wants the uh, signed email attribute, and the attacker now doesn't change anything. The attacker just forwards this request to Gmail. Gmail asks for the credentials, the attacker signs in, and sends back the OpenID assertion containing the signed email address of the attacker. So no attack to, uh, up to this point. And now the attacker can do the following. The attacker adds another attribute, another email attribute. And um, yeah, you can guess what happens. Um, the uh, document is forwarded to Gmail. Gmail checks the signed part of the document, which is still fine. Sends back to Sideshow that everything is fine with this document, and Sideshow selects the wrong email address. Yeah, and now the user, uh, the attacker is signed in into any user account again. Okay, um, so this was the second identity forgery attack. Uh, we also found another attack which is not very spectacular. And we also looked, uh, so this was all, uh, of course, authentication. And we also took a look at privacy. Um, so as you remember, privacy says that, uh, or in a, words of Mozilla, the browser ID protocol never leaks tracking information back to the identity provider, <laughs> except it does. Um, so ideally, the identity provider should be unable to tell where the user logs in. In fact, this is broken, um, because in a browser the following happens. If a malicious identity provider wants to find out whether a user is locked in at some specific relying party or not. Then the malicious identity provider can just open an iframe containing the website of that relying party he wants to probe. Now the following happens. Um, the normal JavaScript of uh, browser ID runs in this relying party because it has browser ID support, obviously, and creates an iframe. And inside this iframe, another iframe will be created. But this innermost iframe will only be created if the user logged in at this RP before. Now, since the outermost and the innermost iframe, they come from the same source, and of course, they can collaborate and communicate. Um, they can, for example, just send a post message, say, hi, the user logged in at this relying party before. So, an identity provider can easily probe whether a user locked in at some relying party or not. Um, and this, unfortunately, cannot be fixed without a major redesign of browser ID because they relied on all these iframes and so on. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, this, this can be considered broken beyond repair. We also found some variants of these uh, privacy attacks which rely on other mechanisms, but uh, essentially, yeah, you get the idea. Uh, privacy in browser ID is broken. Okay, so to sum up, um, browser ID, um, we found attacks, but we also were able to fix uh, them uh, in respect, uh, with respect to security, and uh, we also used our formal methods to prove the security of the fixed browser ID system. But privacy is broken beyond repair.
Okay, uh, this leads us to the question, can we build a single sign-on system that provides security and privacy in the web? Um, so we thought a lot about this question, and uh, then we used uh, our formal model to design uh, such a single sign-on system, and uh, we could also then uh, use the formal model to prove that these properties are actually fulfilled. So um, the uh, basic principle of, of the system, it's called Espresso for secure privacy respecting single sign-on, is the following. Um, we have the user with her browser. This user wants uh, to log in at some reliant party, for example, at Wikipedia. So it, um, here we have the same, uh, same idea as in browser ID to use the email address and the email provider uh, as the identity provider. So the user enters her email address and then the relying party asks for some proof uh, of, the, uh, of this identity. So the uh, user goes to her email provider, which is her identity provider in this case, authenticates there, and then this, uh, the identity provider creates a document uh, that proves the uh, Alice's identity, and Alice then forwards this document to the relying party, and the relying party can check if everything is all right, and then consider the user to be logged in. So let's have a closer look on how this system works. So here again, we have Alice's browser, the window of the relying party. Uh, Alice enters her email address. The email address is sent to the relying party. And now the relying party creates a document that contains the identity of the relying party itself. And this document is encrypted, and we call this document then the tag. So now the tag is sent along with the key that was used to encrypt this document. So this is symmetric encryption with a fresh key, uh, sends it to the browser. And now in the browser, um, the uh, Espresso code opens a new window of the identity provider uh, that is given by the domain of the email address and um, sends the uh, tag over to this window. Um, this uh, login dialog prompts the user to authenticate, so the user now enters her password. And uh, this is sent along with the tag to the server. And now the server creates this document I've just uh, uh, spoken of in the last slide. And uh, this uh, document, we call it the uh, user certificate, or the, no, user, user assertion. Sorry, user assertion. We send it back to the uh, window, uh, the login dialog. And now we have a, have a problem. We could just send it over to the Wikipedia window. But I will show you in the minute why this is a bad idea. Uh, so instead, now we have a, th a third party, the forwarder, which, uh, um, um, which serves just a single static JavaScript file. And this is loaded in an iframe in this login dialog. And this uh, iframe gets, this, uh, gets the user assertion, and it also gets the key. And now it can decrypt uh, the tag, look uh, who is the intended receiver, and then it sends over the uh, user assertion to the uh, window of the relying party, which forwards it to the server of the relying party, who then can check if everything is all right and consider the user to be logged in. So why do we need this forward? So at first, it may look strange. Um, so let's look what happens if we just uh, don't have this forwarder. So let's assume the user wants to log in at some malicious relying party at attacker.com, enters her email address, but the attacker wants to impersonate the user. He wants to log in at some other relying party, let's say to Wikipedia, for example. And the attacker goes to Wikipedia, says, hi, I'm Alice, I want to log in. Wikipedia creates a tag. This is sent over to the attacker, who just relays it to the user. User, um, the protocol runs on, the user authenticates uh, to her identity provider, and then we just send the tag over. As uh, the identity provider does not know who, is the, who the intended receiver is, 
Of course, we want to have this privacy feature. This just went through, and the attacker gets the user certificate and uh, user assertion and forwards it to Wikipedia. And then the attacker is considered to be Alice, and this is bad. So we need some mechanism to prevent uh, that the uh, user assertion is forwarded to some random party, but only to the intended receiver. And for this, we have this forwarder. Now you can think this forwarder may be also malicious, but um, uh, let's talk about, them, about this in a second. So let's just talk about what the forwarder does. So the forwarder gets, this, uh, gets the user assertion, and he gets the, the key um, to decrypt the tag, and now he can instruct the browser to send a post message, but only to, Wiki, to a window of Wikipedia. So the browser checks is the receiver of a window of Wikipedia or not, and if it's not, it doesn't deliver this message. So this protects the, um, the uh, user assertion to be leaked. And uh, now you may think this forwarder may be malicious and deliver some other script that does strange things, like forwarding things to the attacker directly, but we can enforce that the correct script is running inside that iframe using sub-resource integrity, where you just uh, tell the browser in this window only uh, this code may run. And uh, in this case, the forwarder cannot just put some arbitrary or malicious code in this iframe. And also, uh, there is no information that leaks back from the browser to the forwarder. So to sum this up, as uh, I've just presented Espresso, uh, it features uh, uh, privacy and authentication. It's open and decentralized, so you don't need any specific central party. Um, it's compliant to web standards that's based on HTML5, and we have formal proofs that all these properties uh, we've uh, talked uh, at the beginning uh, actually hold. And you can find a demo and more information on espresso.me. Okay. Now to conclude the talk, what is the takeaway? Um, first of all, um, we've talked, I think, most of the time about OAuth 2.0. Uh, most of the results also translate to OpenID Connect. Um, we have formally proven the security of the protocol of OAuth and also OpenID Connect, um, which is um, which is a nice result. Um, of course, if you are okay with having no privacy, because uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect don't have any of uh, any any kind of privacy that we talked about. Um, regarding OAuth 1.0 and OpenID, uh, I think they can be considered deprecated and shouldn't be used. Browser ID Mozilla Persona was a nice experiment, uh, but is dead now, um, and also has broken privacy. Um, with Espresso, we have shown, however, that you can achieve privacy in web single sign-on using standard HTML5 features and standard web features. Um, but, of course, uh, for now, it is a proof of concept. As you have seen, we don't even have a nice logo yet. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and one um, target audience are certainly developers, developers, developers. Um, use libraries wherever possible. Um, for example, PYOIDC is uh, written even by members of the uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect working groups, so they know what they do, hopefully. Um, also, regarding RSCs, um, they are hard to read. And information is often spread across several documents. Um, they are often not written clearly, and they are not always up to date. But they are still an important reference, and I think uh, it's a good advice to look at the RFCs from time to time, even if they are hard to read. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you want to talk to us, come to us at the Machine Deck Assembly in Hall 3 or uh, join us at the next uh, Pi and More, shameless plug here, January 14 in Krefeld, or uh, at the University of Stuttgart start starting in January. Thank you very much.
Now we have eight minutes for questions. What do we have from the internet? <laughs> so we've got uh, two questions from the internet. Can you hear me? Yeah. So at the diagram you showed at uh, one of the first slides, why does the authentication follow authorization? Shouldn't it normally be the other way around? Ah, yeah. Um, barely. So Can you try to repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. At the diagram you showed in one of the first slides, why does the, authent why does the authentication follow authorization? Shouldn't it normally be the other way around? Um, okay. Uh, so these are two concepts that uh, are kind of uh, orthogonal to each other. Um, so um, you can either do authentication to uh, be, uh, ensure yourself of the user's identity, or you can act on the user's behalf at the identity provider, like uh, posting on the user's Facebook timeline or doing different uh, things there. But for authentication, you need to retrieve uh, some uh, unique user identifier. And this basically makes use of this authorization mechanism. So you get authorized to access this unique user identifier, and you use this then for authentication. Thank you. Questions from here? So for the Espresso protocol, uh, you said you need the forwarding party to check uh, whether the certificate was actually from Wikipedia and not from attacker.com. But could Alice do this check herself? Uh, you mean that you uh, um, show, present the user something and the user uh, accepts this and or re declines this in this sense? Uh, or? Um yeah, she has the challenge that is signed by her email provider, and she has the key that encrypted Wikipedia's identity. So yes. she could use that to decrypt it and check if it's Wikipedia or attacker.com. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. In, in principle, yes. So, so uh, you mean the user yeah. could check? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, the user could, of course, check. We could ask the user, did you really want to sign in at attacker.com or at wikipedia.com? Uh, but of course, we all know that users are bad at making decisions. So, yeah. Thank you. Questions from here? Hi. Thanks for the informative talk. But I wanted to add a remark. It is highly unfair to call users stupid for falling victim to click checking and phishing because they are working professionally on, then, uh, on enabling click checking and phishing. And if you need a 4K monitor just to see that there is some JavaScript added at like 1,000 uh, zero millimeters, it is impossible to blame a user for being stupid yes. for falling yes. victim to click checking. So yes. just yes, for yes, the next that time. is correct. Um, it uh, also sometimes you just can't see it. So yes. Thank you. Questions from down there. Sorry. Questions. Um, you talked about uh, formal verification of both uh, OAuth and your protocol. I uh, wanted to know uh, what kind of, uh, I don't know, program or whatever you used, like uh, Proverif, uh, Tamarin, whatever. Mm -hmm. And also, I think you just proved uh, the, uh, you, you just verified the subset of OAuth. Um, so uh, let's start with the second question first. So for OAuth, we really try to introduce as many options as we could find in the standard, so to say. Um, OAuth is a very like, loose standard, so they give you a lot of options in many ways. Um, we had to exclude some of them uh, for practical reasons when modeling the stuff, but we included almost all of the options that OAuth provides. And uh, we also have an, a detailed write-up of wh what the options are and uh, uh, that we excluded and that we included. And now for the first part of the question, um, our model currently is a manual model, so uh, what we do is pen and paper proofs. Um, the reasoning behind this is that um, if you have tools, they are always in some sense limiting you. And when we started out with this work, um, 
there was uh, or there were two models essentially um, already existing web models, uh, formal web models, so in the same uh, area as we are, but they were both based on um, a model checker, so one on Proverif, the other one on uh, another modeling tool, uh, Alloy. Alloy. And uh, both were limited by the possibilities that you had in these uh, model checkers. So what we went the other way around. What we wanted to do is a manual model that includes uh, that, that models the web really precisely and comprehensively. And then as a second step, what we are currently uh, working on or discussing about is uh, to transfer this into some kind of tool. Thank you. Two more questions. Questions from the internet? So I was wondering uh, if you know about IndieAuth and Realme Auth and what you think about the question of using domain names versus email addresses as the user identifier. Uh, could you repeat that a bit louder, please? Uh, um, so if, if you have any comments about IndieAuth and Realme Auth, which uses the domain name as identifier rather than an email address. Uh, so we didn't look at these systems. Yes, last I question. Have, uh, the question regarding the forwarder and the privacy protection uh, realized with the forwarder. As far as, as I understand, the forwarder is used in an, uh, its own iframe to prevent the IDP from taking control of the verification process, uh, knowing that who is the, uh, the final uh, uh, system. Yes. But what if the identity provider and the forwarder collaborate? then the privacy would be broken. Yes, uh, if, we, if uh, we have these parties uh, collaborating, then of course they are broken. Uh, so we, I haven't uh, we haven't shown all the details of this system. So um, this is really hard to prevent. But um, in Espresso, the relying party uh, is allowed to choose which uh, forwarder has to be used. So relying party should choose a forwarder run by some trustworthy party. So this is the countermeasure to prevent uh, collaboration. But if these parties collaborate, then you are screwed. Yes. So we also, so I think it's also important to add, um, so the forwarder is kind of a semi-trusted party. Um, because on the one hand, we can enforce uh, that it's, um, it uses the correct code. Um, of course, the uh, IDP then has to uh, enforce this. Um, on the other hand, you still have some side channels, like for example, timing. So if you control the parties, then um, you could check uh, which IP addresses access, for example, the forwarder and the IDP at the same time, or, and so on. So there are some side channels still. Um, so the idea that we have to minimize this risk is to provide a set of trusted forwarders uh, that could be, for example, um, provided by some trusted uh, parties like Mozilla or the EFF or something, so that you have a set of forwarders to choose from and hopefully choose a trusted one. Thank you. You're welcome. Gerda Schmitz and Daniel Fett, thank you so much for the great talk. Please give You're them welcome. another great round of applause.